A presentation of the United States Fish and Wildlife Service National Conservation Training Center, providing leadership in learning to conserve fish, wildlife, and natural resources. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service chose Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge for the site of their homecoming. Bounded by water on three sides, the refuge had no coyotes to breed with wolves and further dilute the species. Once we went in and evaluated it and determined that it was biologically feasible, then we spent a year doing nothing but outreach, and that was speaking with every group we could talk to, hunter groups, agricultural groups, and everybody, and getting the message out of what the wolf really was. The eastern United States has only a few large areas of wildlands left. Fortunately for the wolf, northeastern North Carolina is one of those places. But those wild lands also adjoin farms and small towns. Some people were concerned about their new neighbor, the red wolf. But Jamin Simmons believes that red wolves and people can live together. We see wolves probably um, seven or eight occasions through the year, uh, not on a regular basis. Simmons sees the benefits. With wolves around, he loses less of his crop to foraging deer and spends less on road and dike repair for burrowing nutria, an exotic and troublesome species imported from South America. So at this point, everything that we've seen from the red wolf has been a positive benefit. Humans and wolves must live together if the red wolf is to survive. It isn't always easy, and local citizens are quick to speak their mind. If they get hungry enough, what will they do? As far as we know, a white red wolf has never attacked a person. But as a precaution, for safety reasons, it's important to remember never to approach a wolf or any other wild animal. To address the concerns of people who live near wolves, the government relaxed regulations, allowing landowners to kill red wolves if they attack pets or livestock. To be legal, there must be evidence of the attack, and the killing must be reported within 24 hours. Compensation is available, but the need for such a remedy is extremely rare. With abundant prey, the predators have plenty to eat without preying on domestic animals. That much is known, but there's plenty more to learn about the red wolf. The red wolf's road to recovery was built on a foundation of ingenuity and good science. When the program began in the 1970s, the first task was to find the last remaining wolves and capture them. Taking advantage of the wolf's howling response to sirens, scientists used sensitive listening devices to distinguish between wolf howls and that of coyotes and dogs. Triangulating the howls pinpointed the wolf's location. Special toothless traps were effective and caused little harm. The jaws of the trap are rounded, smooth and offset to reduce damage to the foot. DNA testing, something taken for granted today, was still in its infancy, so the team used x-rays for selecting the founders of future generations. Comparing known red wolf skulls with those of recently captured animals helped the team identify features unique to the red wolf. A variety of skull and skeletal measurements proved to be the best science available at the time. Today, a new generation of biologists carries on the tradition, solving new problems with new tools, but always with the same keen eye and attention to detail. For wolf biologist Jennifer Gilbreth, even a wolf's droppings offer valuable clues about the wolf's diet and health. Roundworms in there. And the wolf scat holds DNA that may allow future scientists to map the wolf family tree. Saving a species is often hard and dirty work. Biologist Art Beyer captures wolves. Okay, right here. Art records the wolf's size, weight, sex, and age. From its blood and vital signs, valuable information is gathered about its health and genetic identification. Okay. 
A radio tracking collar allows the wolf to be located in the wild. Frightened but unharmed, this red wolf is anxious to get as far away from humans as possible. Oh good, maybe we'll see him again someday. Tracking by radio telemetry allows biologists to learn more about the wolf's home range, lifespan, and social behavior, essential data for enhancing its chances for survival. As wolves slowly gain a foothold in their former range, small changes are taking place in the natural world around them. The balance is returning. Struggling to slide its bulk across the beach, this endangered loggerhead turtle is obviously out of its element. But this sea-loving creature has an unlikely ally on land, one of the most effective predators the land has ever seen. There are specific cases where large predators being absent from an ecosystem has had a negative impact on other species. For example, on many of the island sites where we have had red wolves before. The raccoons are uh, number one nest raiders for the sea turtles. Uh, raccoons are just happen to be the number two prey item in the red wolf diet. So some of these island propagation programs have seen direct benefit uh, in other endangered species specifically from having red wolves on the island. With the return of the red wolf to the island propagation sites, a better balance of nature can exist. We know red wolves eat a large number of raccoons, and um, there's absolutely no reason that the balance we see being maintained on the island by a top predator isn't important on the mainland as well. The red wolf's appetite for raccoons could help increase the numbers of ground nesting birds like quail and turkey. But wolves also eat deer, and that upsets some hunters. However, North Carolina records show that deer harvest numbers have changed only slightly since the wolves were released in 1987. Still, the Fish and Wildlife Service believes cooperation with neighbors is crucial for the long-term success of the wolf restoration project. The Red Wolf Recovery Program was designed for people and wolves to coexist. We do not affect legal land practices in the presence of a wolf. History has proven that um, humans can wipe the wolves off the face of the United States once, and that could happen again. Uh, support of private landowners uh, we knew and has continued to be critical to the successes of this program. Even with some controversy, the Red Wolf Project works. The wolves are reproducing. But it's important to mention one very serious threat. Coyotes are moving into northeastern North Carolina. And as they encroach on the red wolves' territory, they are also breeding with the wolves. It's a problem biologists are studying very closely, not just in North Carolina, but other places where the coyotes are invading. This expansion has resulted in a situation where hybridization threatens our ability to recover the red wolf. It makes a very difficult challenge that much more difficult. We need to think about our impact on the environment on a much bigger scale. Not to think about what we do on one tract of land, but what it does to an ecosystem or to a whole range of a large predator. We're beginning to think that way. We're thinking in landscape terms. We're now thinking in ecosystem management. Um, this is the approach we're going to have to take if we're going to prevent other species from getting to the point that red wolves are at now. Uh, Many challenges remain. But that doesn't erase the triumph of the red wolf's comeback and the impact it has had on other endangered species. Oftentimes, by the time we list an endangered species, it's in such dire straits that the only hope left is a successful reintroduction. And so the kinds of lessons that we've learned from the red wolf project uh, can be exported into other, not only wolf reintroductions, but other species reintroductions across the country. In the United States alone, there are more than 300 plant and animal species being saved from extinction by propagation programs. In North Carolina, the call of the wild is calling tourists. 
Nearly $40 million a year may be generated by people interested in the red wolf. Well, thank you all for coming out this evening um, to our wild red wolf howling safari. Every sighting, every howling is cause for excitement. One, two, three. Oh! But the awe of hearing long lost voices is tempered by reality. The red wolf's future remains uncertain. Continued success will take a lot of work by a lot of people. It will take good science and professional wildlife management. And it will take a deeper appreciation of the parts we all play in conserving and protecting our web of life. The red wolf like so many other endangered species, represents a call to action for preserving and protecting our community of plants and animals, our ecosystem. From microscopic plankton to the greatest ecosystem of all, our Earth, every species, every precious strand in the web of life is worth saving. For it is biological diversity that supports all living things, including people, and the Red Wolf.